Hello, my friends, and welcome to the Space Game Junkie Podcast. As always, your co-host, Brian. <clears throat> Full of phlegm today. You're going to have to excuse me. I'm going to try and not let that happen again. Uh, and joining us, as always, is your co-host, Spaz. Welcome to allergy season. Yeah, uh, I don't. No, I don't have allergies. It's just I have a con, I have a condition. <laughs> well, one of many, uh, but it's a completely different thing. Um, but uh, Jim uh, sadly is not is having some internet issues, and I think uh, Hunter is too because they're both in the same part of the country. And the storms uh, right now, folks. The um, <clears throat> a good chunk of the country has been massively hit with winter storms. And like power has been out, internet's been out all over the place. So a lot of people are having problems. So uh, Jim and Hunter seem to be uh, mired in that right now. So not sure if they're going to be able to join us in the midst of this or not. We hope that they get their stuff back in order soon. It's been just a mess here. Uh, but folks, we do have a guest today. Um, <clears throat> dang it. Joining us uh, f- both from Sydney, Australia. Uh, Roger Keating and Gregor, is it Wiley? Wiley, yeah. Okay, I, I should have asked before the thing. I, we got wrapped up in conversation. I apologize. Roger Keating and Gregor Wiley, Senior Vice President and Vice President, respectfully, at Strategic Studies Group, or better known as SSG. Uh, I want to sh- send a shout out to my good friend Trevor Sorensen, the uh, guy behind Starfleet 2, for helping put this together. He connected uh, all of us. Because I th- did you guys meet at a, a an Australian like dev Zoom or something? Was that what happened? He's basically a friend of Mark Baldwin's. Yes, uh, who and I'm a friend of Mark Baldwin's. Oh, okay. Uh, I don't know whether we've met. Great, I know we haven't met very often. Um, we may have met at a conference, but uh, mm. you're talking about an old guy here. Yeah, well. <laughs> That's no, totally fair. Um, but I just wanted to say a shout, shout out to him to thank him for connecting us all because you guys have been around uh, since basically the beginning of this whole video game thing. And that's kind of what I'd love to talk about. I mean, you guys did a space game. That's great. We can talk about that too. But I'm particularly interested in the history of video gaming that SSG inhabits because like I think the eighties and nineties, especially were like the real golden age of gaming, especially the nineties. Um, and so I'd love to talk about all that with you guys. Uh, but we might as well get at the space game out of the way first. Um, you guys did what is undoubtedly the first, um, video game four X, which wasn't even called a four X back then reach for the stars, which uh, I played for the first time the other day. <laughs> uh, cause I was not into strategy games when it came out. When it came out, I was ten, and um, I probably—I don't know if I would have had the patience for it when I was ten. To be honest with you, um, I didn't start playing strategy games till I was in my twenties, and um, but I played it the other day for the first time, and damn, that's a good game, you guys. Like, it—it—it it, it really gave me a throbbing, <laughs> and that's one thing you guys are known for, right? Is your AI. If I remember correctly, right? That's one thing you guys are really well known for is your really good AI. And and that game, um, I think the only reason I won my first game is because uh, I followed the tutorial to the letter. <laughs> like, like I had the manual open and it had like the, your first nine turns. Here's what, exactly what you do. <laughs> and that's exactly what I did. Um I did want to ask you guys something because we don't get to talk to a lot of developers who were working back in the day like this. Uh, back in the day, you had to make games for a multitude of platforms. Like today, you know, it's mostly PC, but it's also, you know, sometimes Mac, sometimes Linux. But back then it was multiple Commodores. It was Amiga. It was Atari. It was IBM. Did that? You also fit- yeah, you're also forgetting us that there wasn't a PC. Um, right, right. Basically, you had to take into account every single um, video card that was on the market. Oh, God. Every single one was different. And it was quite common, for example, I know I've, I visited overseas often, and I'd go to Broderbund, and they would have a 
one of their rooms would be just a line of PCs with a different video card in every PC. Oh, God. <laughs> now, they'd, ha- they'd have to put the game in every single one and try it out to make sure that each video card would work with their current game. A valiant effort. Doomed to <laughs> failure, but they had to try. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's, so, that's that's true because the, when did the first PC come out? Was it eighty four? It was 84? very about eighty. Yeah, no, it, it was about eighty. Yeah, right. So that's why the DOS version didn't come out till I think eighty eight. But I think the first version came out. Uh, what was it for the Atari? No, 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 the Commodore and the Apple, uh, if I recall correctly. And so, I was trying to. No, I was trying to ignore the PC as much as I could <laughs> in those early days. Uh, Gregor, I still remember Gregor trying to force me to say, this is a real machine, get into it. And I would simply say, because I was sort of more senior, I've been there longer, I'd just simply say, no. <laughs> eventually, <laughs> eventually, no doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god because it's kind of funny you making that up because i played two different versions the other day on the stream i first played the um apple 2gs version which was colorful and had graphics for its battle screen and mouse support and like it was all streamlined and then you play the dos version where it's got like next to nothing graphically and it, I mean, there weren't really any sound cards back in 1988, but compare, it was like, boop, 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 you know, <laughs> it's just felt like quite a, almost a different product <laughs> compared to but the But it had great AI. It yeah. had great AI. <laughs> <laughs> Don't they all? <laughs> um, uh, so that, just to put you in the picture for how things started, and Roger can talk about this, but when he started programming, these games he's programming for apple II and commodore 64 in assembler right and and, no, and uh, essentially ignoring the operating system and certainly ignoring things like apple basic right so uh, that was real programming rog the the only way you could really do it uh, i actually i'm I, the sheets have gone missing somehow. I actually mapped out the 64K of memory in each machine. And then I would allocate um, each row of bytes to various parts of the program. And that way I could um, I could allocate how much room for AI, how much room for graphics, how much room for other things within the game. Um, and even to the point where if anything had to be loaded in on top of something else, uh, like when you're doing AI, you don't need the user interface, so you can throw that out, um, and then it comes back in and the AI is gone um, for a turn-based game. Uh, those sort of things were the way I, I would program in the larger level. Then the rest, as Gregor said, you had to do things as fast as humanly possible on a one megahertz machine. <laughs> uh, and the only way to do that was through, uh, was through using assembler language. Only way to do assembler language was learn it from scratch. Oh, uh, really? There were no books. Yeah, I've, you just sat down. I actually was reading what Apple had written in and, and writing out what it was doing. That's how I learned how to program. Oh, wow. So you watched um, what the machine was doing. Well, also, I, I got myself a, 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 an assembler, um, which meant you could type in LDA uh, 30 or uh, various other things, which are just simple instructions. But as to how to program, I just knew, for example, if you want to multiply by 10, don't, because it doesn't. Multiply by eight, multiply by two, then add those two together. Um, that was an easy way of multiplying by ten. <laughs> <laughs> so there, there were just so many things you had to know, yeah. and if you weren't maths oriented, which I tended to be, um, and also corruptly minded, which apparently I am, uh, you you could do all of this. 
Um, other people in the industry felt that programming in BASIC was much better because you could just say what you wanted, but it took so much memory and it was so slow. So the computer game that SSI put out called Ambush, which was a perfect example of what this was like. When you ended your turn, the computer took an hour to work out what it was going to do. Wait, an hour? It, that's what it said. And I said, it has to be joking. What? And I thought it was just, it was just a mistake on the screen. An hour later, I could then do something. Oh, my God. <laughs> that's what and, happens if you program those old machines in, in Apple Basic, right? It's, it's slow. I mean, I know we had fewer games to play back then, but that's that's kind of ridiculous. <laughs> talk, talk to anyone who's actually played that game. I've still got it. I, I think it's out there. Um, I can prove it. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I mean, I believe so, it. Just Wow. You know, design decisions like, can we do this, would often come down to Roger saying, well, I think I've got a bit, not a byte, not a megabyte, or not a, well, I don't care because I'm using Unity. I think I've got a bit over here, which is not being used for anything else at that point in time, so I can dedicate that to a little flag that says uh, day or night or weather or something, you know. Uh, and it came down to that level because there was the, the li- memory was so limited and we wanted to do so much that we just had to rely on Roger to, to make this alchemy happen. It actually meant that at the beginning of our game design sessions, the very beginning, I could say no to anything I didn't like. <laughs> um, Gregor quickly picked up on this as a <laughs> feature I was using. And he demanded a funny concept, which was called, I had to reason my arguments. <laughs> so I'd say, well, the AI can't do this because A, B, C, D, and E, because no one's going to know that. And he would come back the next day and say, well, look, A can be solved by this, B can be solved by that, D that, E that, and so do it. <laughs> and I, I'd have to say, oh, my reasoning has to get a lot better. <laughs> <laughs> now, when things got a little more consolidated in the 90s, like clearly Windows was winning the platform war, uh, as it were, did that th- make things easier or more challenging? Not really, because... Windows, as it existed back then, was useless for gaming. <laughs> and that's, that's Well, that's why Microsoft had to hack um, it, their own system to produce WinG, which eventually became DirectX, yes. yeah. right? You could not, in the same way that you could not write a useful game in, in Apple Basic or any equivalent, you could not write a useful game in Windows 3 because of the stupid design decisions they'd made about hardware abstraction. It was just too slow. It didn't work. So all of those Windows games were, in fact, DOS games. Right. With with a little Windows fronty bit, um, but it was DOS. And so you were still doing your own mouse management. You couldn't use the Windows mouse. You're doing your own memory management and all the other things because Windows was useless. <laughs> Yeah, it's funny. I recently played a game, uh, revisited a game called, I don't know if you heard of it, Stars with an exclamation point. Um, and the best way to get it to run is to run DOSBox, which then runs Windows 3.1, which then runs the game. <laughs> like, what is this? <laughs> Look, and the thing that really struck us going to, com- we went to conferences in America all the time. And I still remember when, Microsoft turned up with this thing they called DirectX. Um, Immediately, the programmers sat down with me amongst them to and analyzing how how they had tricked us (laughs) because everything was byte aligned. The way they had organized everything was was actually, it worked well in their example, but in the game, it would fall over. But... What Microsoft did after that conference was they then hired uh, uh, some of the best game programmers in existence. Mm. They took it seriously. The next year, they really had a product. Oh, wow. Uh, I can only, but I, whoever was running at Microsoft in those days, and I think Gregor knows who, who these people were, um, 
they just did a tremendous job. Wow. See, what had really happened is that the eye of Sauron in the form of Bill Gates <laughs> had, had looked out over his empire and, and, you know, the office stuff here yeah, that's running under Windows, all this other stuff, right? games not running under Windows, not acceptable, do something, <laughs> right? And being Microsoft, it took them, you know, seven odd numbered versions of things to get it right, but they were told everything will run under Windows, there will be no exceptions and no excuses. So eventually they got it right. Wow. It became one OS to rule them all. <laughs> Look, uh, totally correct. Um, what happened then, which was a bit of a problem, they said that every video card company had to abide by um, DirectX standards. And so the video card company would say, yes, we abide by those standards. So Microsoft would say, fine, and out it would go. Initially, a few lied. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, and when you actually, can you do this? Yes. Ah, do that. Crash. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> but that actually cleared itself up in literally about six months to a year. Um, and uh, the, those cards were no longer in existence because Microsoft got very angry. <laughs> uh, and everything ran to one standard. And that was just amazing. Yeah, I, um, I as a player, I watched this all like coalesce and happen, and it was it's kind of fascinating. Like you, you want like I, I love telling people who weren't around the '90s like how crazy the '90s were for just stuff like that. Like you look at a game that came out in 1990 versus a game that came out in 1999. It's like night and day in so many ways, and that's one of the reasons I think is that unifying <clears throat> of the platform like that. Um, and, and, and you guys, you guys had a very successful run in the nineties. Well, what was like, cause I'd only first ever heard of you cause of warlords. Um, my first strategy game ever was warlords Two deluxe, uh, back in 1995. Uh, I saw it in the store and I was like, what is this? I had never played a strategy game before. Uh, and I was enthralled and I became a huge fan of you guys after that. I actually started playing war games because of you guys too. You and SSI got me into war games as well. Uh, so thank you for that <laughs> because you have some history with SSI too. All so part of the outreach mission. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, yes, I think Warlords was by far and away the one bit of program, a game that I programmed that I really enjoyed the most. Um, it was actually fun. Um, it was a delight to program. Uh, the AI was just exceptionally uh, a challenge. Uh, it set up a whole new, I'll use the word paradigm here, Greg will correct me if I'm wrong, <laughs> of, of how you go about looking at eight players and how you can allow the player to enjoy themselves and then win. With the occasional time when I could actually beat them as well. <laughs> That's a good point because there's so many. I love strategy games, don't get me wrong, but there's so many I run into where eventually it's like it gets stressful. You know, it starts getting really stressful to play them. And Warlords, especially, never stressed me out. I mean, I would lose constantly, but it was always a good time. I think it's because, because it's fantasy. There's a, I don't mean to call your game silly, but it's fantasy and there's a silliness inherent in fantasy. Uh, which made it like when I would play a World War II game and I lost, I was like, oh, you know, oh no, uh, I feel I'd actually feel a little bad. But like with a fantasy game, it, it allows you to be a little more um, easygoing on yourself. And you guys probably had a great time coming up with all these factions, this whole universe, basically, uh, that you can call your own, I'm guessing. Yeah. Well, they, we all had different roles. so. Um, my role obviously was to make the AI as tough as possible. So mm -hmm. Gregor would then say, make an easy mode, which I then did. And then he said, now make a easy mode properly. Which <laughs> I then said, I can't lose to this. And he says, you can make it easier. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
<laughs> Ian, Ian Trout, who was also involved in the design, his job was to make it really, really hard at some point. He loved the idea that you could lose your hero, to which Gregor, was, who being the overall uh, manager of the project, would say, you can't have that, Ian. <laughs> or he'd modify it. Uh, uh, Steve Faulkner in Melbourne was the role-playing man who controlled the dragons, the the spells, the 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 wonderful uh, the diversity of of races, uh, uh, and uh, a tremendous amount of stuff in the game was down to him. Uh, so Gregor had to oversee all these different elements to to bring it together to a point where it actually worked, and that that was a it really was a wonderful wonderful game. Yeah, I think. Sorry, go ahead. There's, well, there's a couple of things I'd, I'd just like to bring up about what we've just discussed. The, for the AI, the overall rule that we used was that the AI should give you a good hard game, and then if you were sensible, you, would, you the player, would win, right? Mm. Um, because you can make an AI that is unbeatable, what is the point of that, right? It's not fun, um, yeah. Uh, no, and um, it paints everything else that you do, right? So it's not that, um, you know, we're making a super AI, but we're making an AI that's smart enough that players think or can allow themselves to think that there's a human making those decisions and it's not just a robot assembling a, an un unkillable stack. Um, the other thing was that we never, ever, ever tried to interfere in how people played the game, right? If they wanted to play easy, they can play easy. It's their game. They bought it. They play it how they want it. Uh, case in point was I said we can have the game with no AI opponents, just you and everything else neutral. Right? And so Roger's daughter would play it in that mode and take over all the neutral castles and assemble vast fleets of griffins. No, 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 sorry. She, she got me to tell her all the cheat codes. <laughs> but the point is, that's how she wanted to play the game. Why should we care, right? We're mm. not here to say only this way is, is acceptable or only hardcore counts and everything else is trash, you know. That, that sort of condescension is, is just, it alienates people. And you do not know how or why people get the game, what they're going to do with it. That's why we always had the editors in the game, so you could make your own armies. Did we care if you made a, a Disney version and violated 57 copyright rules? No. That, <laughs> you could do that. Did we care? No. No. We, in fact, we loved it, right? We'd probably play that ourselves. So, you know, that's why we tried to make things as flexible as possible. Well, it seems to have worked because like your series, this series especially was successful, but I was looking like through your, uh, through the Wikipedia page, you guys were so prolific for a good number of years. You were not only putting out like more warlords titles, but like more war games, like in the same year, like how busy did you guys get at your peak? Uh, well, I worked pretty lot. <laughs> we, we were working hard back then, but we had... <coughs> Like Steve Faulkner, the originator of Warlords, lived in Melbourne, right? Mm -hmm. And so because SSG had never had an official office, we'd always work from home. We said, okay, you stay in Melbourne. Um, even though I think 99% of companies would have said, well, we want you here in Sydney, right? It's more convenient for us. Get your ass up here. <laughs> um, so over time, he then had... Uh, a lot of people working for him, all in Melbourne, on the Warlords programming side of things. We had uh, some artists on staff, but then we had freelancers all over Australia working on the art. And that left Ian and Roger back up in Sydney able to do war games things um, without taking up too much of their time on, on the Warlord stuff, but still being intimately involved in the things that they needed and wanted to be part of for Warlords. So it, it worked there for a while. Yeah, because, like, I'm just looking through your list and, like, 
there are some years where you had multiple <laughs> games come out the same year, like really impressive, um, which you don't see a lot of. Um, I wanted to compliment you guys on something else. I mean, a lot of people talk about your AI, but I wanted to talk about your UI for a second because I did a little homework before uh, this show and playing uh, not only Warlords, because that's, um, that's what's streaming uh, behind us on the video, but I played a couple of your war games, um, including Carriers at War. I got a copy of that from the nice folks at Matrix, um, and I streamed that. And I was just amazed at how good and clean your UI was, given that these games came from an era where there was really no, uh, what's the word? There was really no like coherent, like no standards. Right? Yeah. Really no standards on UI. It was just a like everyone did something different. And uh, you guys, even in different games had a very, like I was, I was playing carries of war and was just like, there's a lot going on here, but this UI is amazingly efficient. And so I, I just had to give you props on that because I'm a, I'm a UI nut, and so many it's it just seems so hard to get a, a UI right, you know. You you do not need standards to tell you what to do <laughs> if you have the right philosophical approach in the first place, right? So I had a lot to do with the UI stuff, and um. You know, I just had a couple of rules. One was that if something annoyed me, then it was a problem, <laughs> right? Um, and But more broadly, why make things hard, right? Every time you expose some function or some information, there has to be a good way of doing that in the right context at the right time and put together with the other information that you need to make decisions. Now, we play all our games a lot back then, right? So we know, okay, what am I doing when I'm assembling a strike in carriers? Well, what do I need to know? What stuff don't I need to know? What's really important to me right here, right now? And uh, we had some really excellent programmers who could, you know, do things back then which are pretty... Uh, revolutionary, like the little movable window stuff that's all done by us. It's, it's not Unity doing that or anything else. That's us. <laughs> right? When I say us, I mean the programmers making it work. But that was the whole idea, right? Here's your game map. Here are information blocks. You can decide where you put them. You can decide if you want that thing displayed or not. Uh, the clock management was really important. So, you know, we made that easy because that's the heart of the game is I'm watching stuff. I'm like, oh, I don't like that sighting. I, I need to do something right now. That's, you don't know, you do not need a standard to tell you how to do it. In fact, the standard probably won't, right? It's knowing your game and knowing what's important. And what, one thing that Ian Trout was really good at, in fact, superb at, was deciding out of all the factors that you could model, what's really important. And and so we abstracted a fair amount of stuff in our war games and sometimes people would sneer at that. But if you give people a list of, you know, how many thousand gallons of gasoline they have, what are they going to do with that? What does that mean? Hmm. Is 11,097 tonnes of gas, how much better is that than 9,834? You don't know, right? <laughs> That's the sort of stuff you can abstract. They say, your supply is good. No, your supply is not good. Ah, I better do something about that. Um, so that a lot of that really high-level stuff came from me in, in terms of distilling what was really essential. And then it was my job to make that available to the player right when and where they needed it. So we had all of our big arguments were all about this. Right. We never had an argument about what game we're going to do or, you know, the, the meta stuff of the game. It was all about, can we have a button to do this? Do we need a button to do this? <laughs> if we have a button to do this, does that mean 
we're telling this player this here, so we have to tell him that there. You know, those arguments subsumed a lot of time, but they were necessary, right? We we needed to winnow through all that to get to something like the carriers of war. Yeah, if I can just add in one thing here, and just to express how this happened with Ian, I went into him one day and said that I was trying to organise the AI with the planes, particularly the torpedo planes, or even dive bombers coming in at um, carriers at war. How they split, how did they organise what they were going to hit? Um, I mean, you've got a squadron of twenty aircraft. I don't know what a squadron is. I mean, you know, I'm a programmer. Um, <laughs> How do you split it up? What what do you do? I, you know, I would just choose a ship and bomb it. And he actually sat down in front of me, and in a process of about took about thirty minutes because I just sat quietly. I wasn't going to say a thing. He wrote out an A four sheet of paper, which was essentially pseudo code, and he handed it to me and he says, "Do that." <laughs> I then went home. He was wrong on about. Maybe five percent, two or three things. I, you know, you had to reshape, but essentially he had it correct. He, he had organised, you know, how you actually. He could actually explain to me, and because he knew me, he could talk my language, which was something that again, Gregor took about a year or two years to figure out. Ian had known me for a short while; he figured it out as well, because. It's not just the fact that you say something to a person, but you've got to say to it in the language that they truly understand. Um, we learned that once with our artist who, during a meeting, once said, do you mind if I do the next painting in oils? And we said, yes, because we didn't understand what oils meant. <laughs> <laughs> and six months later, we got back the most beautiful painting, but it took a long time to do. <laughs> Would it so, have taken? Yeah, yeah, but it was worth it. Oh. <laughs> I guess we, we all believe it worth painting. Oh, it was a Yamato, just fantastic painting. Yeah, uh, I thought of the UI because I was playing uh, Dark Lords Rising today to record the video that's streaming in the background. And you guys, unlike a lot of 90s games, have tooltips in there. You know, you right click a button, it, it tells you what it does. Like, no one was doing that back then. You know, no one was doing anything like that. I was, I was made to do it. <laughs> but so, good. Another, another thing with with warlords that that I wanted was, you know, with a lot of strategy games, and, and even with the first Reach of the Stars, you have all these production centers, whether they're castles or planets, is irrelevant, and stuff is building up on there, and it's up to you to then go and collect all that stuff and take it somewhere useful and then do something useful with it. Um, and I thought, well, that's painful. That's boring. Do I want the job of, you know, deputy chief of staff? No, I'm the general, damn it. <laughs> so in Warlords, you can have the banner and then your production goes to the banner, all right? saves you an awful lot of boring, non-fun, useless time-wasting grind. And you then make the big decision, okay, uh, I'm going to be tacking over here, I want my stuff there, and it gets there, right? Um, and in the later Reach for the Stars, we did that as well. So that's the sort of stuff where you shouldn't make the player do that. They're not going to have any fun doing that. They're just going to go, oh, I've got to go back and collect those skeletons again, right? Cut that out. You do it. <laughs> Solves the problem. Was that kind of efficiency something you always, you guys always strive for? Well, it's, it's part of the, the higher level idea that you don't want to give your player um, boring, tedious stuff to do, right? Why would you do that? Why would you sit down and say, yeah, in order to play this game, you've got to put at least 30% of your time in, in doing level two admin clerking, right? <laughs> Don't. Why do that, right? The computer has all the powers. It knows where everything is. And if you speak nicely to Roger, he can vector those things in you know, 
I won't say easily, but he can do it, right? I know he can do it, but he did do it, so it was doable. Um, and there's also the problem of scale. What works when you've got one castle or two castles gets tedious when you have 15 or 20, all right? I still see that in games today, like World of Warships, which I play. There's now so many warships in the game, you just cannot remember all of them. Which one Which one of those battleships had torpedoes? Originally, no battleships had torpedoes. Now, about eight of them do. You can't remember. I can't remember that. If I was 20, I probably could, but, you know, don't make me remember that. Put that in a UI element somewhere. Just let me look at that and say, ah. He's got torpedoes, right? That just makes the game more fun. Yeah, and I gotta say, like that's we play a lot of indie games, and there that seems to be a forgotten thing a lot of the time. Uh, is I play a lot of indie games where it's like, why am I spending my time doing this? You know, why is this getting in the way of my fun? You know. And I guess when you're just a a single or two developers, you know, it's easy to get lost in that sort of thing. I'm sorry, what were you going to say? One thing that we did do um, very early on was we decided to make an engine which would suit our games, never the game, but one that would be uh, at least extend through the number of games we were doing Hmm. in the sense of handling the UI. So we actually called it Simon's Advanced Graphics Environment because a, a gentleman named Simon did it. (laughs) <laughs> um, shortly after that, obviously, it lasted about three games, and then we had to do another one. And we, we'd called it Sage, which then, that was very good. We, we liked the word Sage. So we changed the name to simply another graphics environment. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and Sage 2 arrived. <laughs> and then Sage 3. And I think Sage 4.2 was the final one we actually did before we switched over to DirectX completely. And um, the engine wasn't quite as serious. Um, but the in those days, you know, the engine would handle everything. So when a programmer would sit down, he would have this tremendous wealth of material he could use and would have to suit everyone else and every other programmer in the company. Um, so, for example, every game you did was a networked game. Even if networking was no component of the game, it was a network game. You had to write it as that. So, uh, if and this was only in the 90s that this really came about, but if the game was successful, uh, make it networked. Mm, just change a few things and you're you're networked. So... It became a much easier process through to to do all the things we wanted to do. The programming became easier as the nineties developed. I had no idea you guys used your your like multiple engines for the same for the same for the same game for, for I mean the same engine for multiple games. Excuse me. Yeah, um, dragons are flying tanks. <laughs> you know, sounds legit. You know, <clears throat> I'm I'm stealing that. I'm start I'm starting a blog and a YouTube channel. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm just gonna steal that right now. And any kind of fantasy style war game or strategy game, it's gonna fall. I'm gonna start covering it. And no, I love that. That's <laughs> yeah. Warlords. The original Warlords was, <laughs> I, I think Gregor will agree, was a war game. <laughs> really, hey, Gregor. You can see, uh, yes, I mean, you can see how th- how games change if you follow things like Warlords. Um, and even uh, games that Steve Faulkner has done since leaving SSG, um, he does a really successful mobile game now on all sorts of formats called Gems of War, right? Oh, that's his? And that's his. Yes. That's, oh, I yes. didn't know that. Yes. I've heard I, even I. I don't play mobile games, and even I've heard of that one. Wow, it's a great game, right? I don't play mobile games either, but I, I spend hours on that one. Really, but Steve Faulkner. But Steve Faulkner is just a design genius. He he knows what he is doing, right? Yeah. Um, but he will tell you himself that the first iteration of Gems of War was very much war game, 
and it had a lot of war gamey type information. And the iterations of that was to strip that away and concentrate more on so the graphics. So the graphics got much bigger and the numbers got less important and the strategy elements of, of the map, which were there originally, are now gone because people play games differently these days and especially on mobile, right? So it has changed to to account for the fact that the way we play games has changed and our mm. games have to change as well. Yeah, I'm, I'm installing Gems of War right now on my phone. I had no idea that was... <laughs> I'm going to try this out. Uh, I didn't... I forgot it was a match three game. I do enjoy a good match three game. Um, it's match three plus. Right. Yeah, there's no. a lot of stuff in there. Ooh. Oh yes. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm going to give it a shot because, yeah. Now, uh, what ha- wh- do you mind if I ask what happened? Like why he left? Is that is that okay for me to ask that? Yes. Sure. Well, there, there's basically two big upheavals in in our history. Okay. One is we started out making our own games, like physically constructing them. We had a factory. We had a shrink wrap machine. Oh, wow. We, it would be, you know, when a game was ready for release, it would be friends and family, all hands on deck, out to the factory, collate the games, shrink wrap the games, box the games, um, and then air freight them around the world. Um, That changed when certain... MBA smarty pants realized that uh, companies, especially American companies, didn't have to pay their bills unless it was to other very large companies, right? Oh. So we ended up, that ended up not viable because people just wouldn't pay us. Um, they'd pay EA because EA could say, well, if you don't pay for this game, you're not getting the next game. And their next game was was three months away, but our next game was a year or 18 months away. So that threat didn't work. So we then had to find publishers, right? Um, And we found uh, Broderbund originally and Microsoft. Um, But times changed and Broderbund sold became what did they first become a company company a company red orb or something yeah red orb yeah red orb and then the learning company oh god yeah right mattel was in there you can imagine how much mattel knew about games back then. oh god yeah Um, everyone was trying to get into games back then like i still laugh that simon and schuster made video games for a while like what (laughs) what was that about (laughs) they had this so you know, by the time of the later Warlords real-time games, um, we were dealing with Ubisoft. Mm-hmm. Right. And I invite your listeners to imagine how much fun that really was. <laughs> oh, no. So, <laughs> um, <sighs> ultimately, that brought an end really to... Um, working with publishers on the big budget games, right? And we had to go back to doing the war games that we could actually fund ourselves. Right. Yeah, because after that, I see you did the course on pocket games, Battles in Normandy, which were all, I played a, yeah. I played a couple of those, and they were, I didn't play them long because I would never win, and then I would get fed up and stop playing. But I bought them, and I tried them, and then I was terrible at them. I was like, okay, I get it. <laughs> I'm not good at this. I, apo- I apologize. No, don't apologize. I love it when a game can kick my ass. When, when, when a game can legitimately kick my ass because it knows how to play the game because it's not cheating or anything, but it plays the game well. I got nothing but, res- I, I, I got nothing but respect for that. I have, a, I have to point out here that we had a tremendous trouble in those days with people saying it's cheating all the time. And I would then say, no, it's not. Um, oh, no. And to the point where I actually had a screen which showed all the dice you had thrown and all the dice the computer had sh- thrown and the averages of them just in case you couldn't divide. Oh, God. And 
then uh, the, the way it came back to Gregor, he had to deal with this, was that apparently the computer was she, it was throwing good dice on the critical combats. Oh, come on. <laughs> oh, yeah, this is true. To which my answer was, look, if our eye was that good, we would be working for the Pentagon and making a million dollars a year and you'll never see us again, right? I mean, honestly. Um, but this this is not – this is a problem for all games, right? Um, so long as you have some AI functions, there will be people who, who scream, it's cheating, it's rigged. Oh, or man. if you're in the mobile field, it's just forcing me to pay money as if it had a gun to your head. Mm. I, I will actually point out here that the way Course on Pocket works uh, for the computer, uh, it actually moves every single man on the board to every single enemy unit it can see. It then has every single combat it can do. It then puts it in a matrix. It then analyzes that matrix to certain uh, possible values. That is, it sorts them to what it regards as being a good combat. It then doesn't take the top one because the human player could actually work this out and arrange a combat which looks good, but in fact is not. Hmm. It will then decide out of about the top four which it's going to take. Because <laughs> it figures that a human player is not going to organize four combats it wants the computer to go for. Hmm. Now, the thing is, a human player can't move every single unit around the map. He can't. Do, so, in a sense, that's cheating. But that is the way the computer the computer works. Yes, because we do not have Pentagon level AI. It doesn't <laughs> think like a human being, right? It, it it thinks doesn't think. It just adds up, right? It's all it's doing, uh, and it's very hard to convince people of that. But that brings me to an important point for AI, which which Roger just raised is that if you have an AI that makes optimum decisions, then good human players will recognize that and can use that to bait the AI. So, and this was Ian's fundamental design, is we always put some randomness in there. Because honestly, what's the difference between the four, first and the fourth best attack? It's, it's a number, right? The difference is, the human player does not know what you're going to do in advance. So in carriers at war, um, the computer doesn't, there's always randomness in the computer's choices, not fast randomness, just enough so that the human can't say, aha, I see the carriers are there and the AI, I know they're going to do this because I've put my carrier there. Ah, uh -uh, not necessarily, I only need a couple of counter examples where the human goes, oh yeah, I know it's gonna happen next. Oh, poo, it didn't happen. <laughs> and they stop predicting and they have to play the game on its merits. Wow. I should actually bring up one point here too that I, I, I have actually just suddenly remembered. And this shows a difference between Gregor and Ian. I actually <laughs> wrote the, the program to get the computer to do all the combats of all possible things. Gregor then said, well, if you've done it for the AI, let's show it to the human. So I put a button in, you hit the button, and it shows you. The, it then shows you what the computer has worked out. And it shows every possible combat on the board, with some of them in green, which means these are good, some of them in red, meaning they're bad. And then said, take that out, because you're showing the human what to do. <laughs> <laughs> you can't do that. So then uh, eventually this was resolved because at the, as you set up the game, you can say, I want to see these values or I do not want to see these values. That's, <laughs> that is awesome. Uh, a moment ago, you guys brought up the uh, real-time strategy Warlords games for a minute, and I just wanted to, again, compliment you on those. Those are some of the uh, Warlords Battlecry 2 is one of my favorite real-time strategy games of all time. You guys... That came out like the tail end of the real time strategy like era, and it still was one of like the best of the business. You know, it it like it was. It still I, is, I think. If, I think it still is. Uh, if, if we'd sold that game to Microsoft, we might be, you know, still in that business, but it didn't work out that way. 
<laughs> but it I, it had like so much variety in the meta me- game. I love the meta game. Uh, so yeah, I just I played so many hours of of Warlords Battlecry two back in the day. So I wanted to thank you guys for that. Um, now, what was the last game you guys put out? Um, Kharkov, I believe. Kharkov. 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 Oh, well, no, anyway. Dnepa was before Kharkov. Oh, because Wikipedia must be wrong then, because there's a across Dnepa Dine- oh, no. 2, it's saying, in 2000. Yes. In ten, but, two thousand, yeah, but Kharkov, I believe, came out after the Nipper. Um, my my feeling is that Kharkov was the one that uh, had a few features in it which the Nipper does not. Mm. It may have been that the Nipper two reintroduced those features. Um, the one I've got is actually a better version than those two. But, <laughs> <laughs> but we won't go there. But it's my 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 question was going to lead to it's been a while. I I noticed yes. since you guys put out a game. Is there? Do you mind if I ask if there's a reason that it's been a while? Um, Ian died in um, in 2011, oh. which really which really shook the company. And uh, oh, um, I'm sorry, Steve. Uh, Oh, uh, you can't be sorry over someone dying. I mean, in my belief, well, I mean, my condolences. Yeah, people. Yes, he, he died. It was a a great shock. Um, he died of cancer. Uh, mm, the sorry. Mm. Uh, basically, it made it very difficult. He was instrumental in keeping SSG running in a um, in a in a way. Um, uh, we would we then tried to reorganize ourselves uh, and. We were seriously involved in a couple of projects which did not come to fruition. I mean, uh, basically, they were called off. I mm. won't go into the details too much. Um, and even now, I'm sitting on a version of, a, of, um, of basically Kharkov, which is very good. But um, can't, I can't guarantee. The one thing you have in Australia is an inability to really get venture capital. This is a serious problem in Australia, oh. not so much in America. Um, in Australia, people think games are for fun. And also children shouldn't play them until they're older. <laughs> and if what? not, maybe not at all. What? Uh, no, I'm, I'm not joking. Oh, no. Um, the, um, there's discussion, for example, that, you know, games are really quite bad for you because they teach you to to waste time. That is um, not no. That <laughs> you're also talking to you're also talking to an ex teacher here, <laughs> who, who while at school was teaching students how great games were. My wife, if I may, if I may, a quick aside. My wife is an mu- elementary music teacher, and she's currently doing a unit on video game music, and the kids love it. Oh. They they love it, you know. That, that this that, is the problem. If they love it, they're not doing serious work. Oh, God. that oh god! Um, <laughs> any any games published <sighs> in Australia are published more or less in spite of our government. Oh God! <laughs> they, yes, they currently give zero dollars to oh. support the games industry. That is. 0.00. That's our federal government. There are state governments which do an awful lot better. The state of Victoria leads by example there. They run the big Melbourne International Games Week and they put serious money That's good. behind their games industry. But funny enough, you have to be a Victorian <laughs> to benefit from that, right? So the federal <laughs> government is worse than useless. Oh, the, no. The, we've tried. There have been inquiries. It's pointed out that they give you know, hundreds of millions of dollars in subsidies to the film industry, which means that, you know, big films like Thor or something come out here. Sure. And the federal government pays them a fortune. Games make more money than films, and yet we get nothing. I mean, if we want money, for example, then what they've actually said to us is get it through the film industry. What? So we would have to go, we'd have to go to what? a film body 
and ask the film body for money to develop our game. What? That uh, is, uh, okay. I, that's, that's the answer we I, get. I'm so angry right that. now. I'm we so angry. We have a really good industry, but it's, you know. It's funded by overseas sports. It exists sport, on, a, on a smell uh, of a spoily rag, right? Yeah. Oh, I am. That's, that angers me because video, for me at least, oh. video games have been such an enriching and joyful <laughs> and th- like they've helped me with critical thinking skills and, and studies have shown that video games help with reflexes and reaction times and critical thinking skills and whatnot. There are lots of benefits and, and I grew up as someone with severe ADHD and video games were one of the few things that would calm me the hell down, you know? Um, so there are so many benefits. I'm just, I'm bamboozled. I'm flabbergasted Yeah, I'm- to hear that. Oh my God. I, 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 no, I, would not imagine that, uh, I would imagine that there are indie devs over there that will turn to crowdfunding in order to. Can you cra- can you crowdfund over there? Like, can you yes, do Kickstarter? I, oh, okay, I, yeah. I I I can't keep track of which countries allow Kickstarter and which don't. You know, um, but that- here they don't know what it here they don't know what it is, so you're allowed to do it. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> no. Oh gosh. Uh, I know that that even digital games are are subject to the Australia tax, where they're priced a lot higher than they are in most of the rest of the world. Uh, they they understand that if money's involved, they should get a bit of it. But they don't understand that if they give money to the industry, they'll probably get more out of it in the lot uh, in eventually. Anyway. That's a that's a foreign concept. Come on, uh, let's be serious. <laughs> That, that would actually be logical. You, uh, you can't I'm, expect well, that. I had no idea. I'm a, pro, I'm a programmer. A, we did have a games fund under a previous government of a, of a different ideological bent, but that was, of course, instantly cancelled when the current lot came to power. Oh, no. Was, you know, the other the other mob's idea. Oh. So it could be good. Sorry. That, maybe that, if I programmed in, maybe if I programmed in Fortran, they'd, they'd actually agree to it. Fortran? <laughs> <laughs> isn't that? I don't know much about language. Isn't that an old one? Is that? Isn't that like? I don't really know much about. Well, it, it comes from the nineteen fifties and sixties, where they seem to be at the moment. Oh God! <laughs> wow, I'm learning so much about and Australia I, tonight. <laughs> yeah. And I, even, I know I even know how to. Pro- I've actually programmed it. I know how to do that. Oh my gosh! Who, who needs Unreal and Unity for God's sake? I mean. <laughs> So, so, so we talked about um, base, not the end, but like the last game. How did, how did, I want to go back to the beginning real quick. How did all, how did SSG yeah. come together? Okay. Uh, this is, Gregor actually existed in, in SSG about two years into its, its existence. So if you don't mind, I'll just express how we got to that point. And then okay. Gregor can take over and express how he go. He really took us through to the next stage. Okay. Um, uh, I was uh, a school teacher. I was a mathematics teacher at a private school because in in Australia, I came from New Zealand, and what they'd like to do is if you hi- you had had to be enrolled to the state, so they could send you to any school in the state once you'd been accepted, and they like to send New Zealanders to the very desert outbacks of Australia. Oh no, because <laughs> yeah, real like Broken Hill, where I was born, right? They oh. could have fitted right in. A great, a great city, Gregor. A great city. I'm not deriding the city. <laughs> great things came out of Broken Hill. <laughs> BHP. Um, but so I actually went to a private school in Sydney uh, because I was a, you know, I was a reasonable teacher. I was a maths teacher, and they were desperate for maths teachers. Um, and then I spent my time doing computers and games. Um, Really, that was the only things I was interested in and taught maths in the spare time. Uh, I was actually right. I I was head of the the president of the Apple user group in Sydney, and I used to write software for them because no one else would. And Ooh. I was writing out one software one day, a free bit of software one day for the group. And a student of mine came past, one of my very good students, and just said, you should publish that. And I looked at it and I looked at him and I looked at it again. And I thought, well, why not? I've never done that before. 
boy, was that the start of something. <laughs> I'd never actually, about three months later and a thousand dollars wasted. And my first game came out and I called it conflict. Um, there's only one spelling mistake in one of the headings in the manual, which still get me. <laughs> uh, if you look at every, every fine line, every, you've proofread everything and you've missed a heading. <laughs> and and uh, anyway, I, I decided to sell these and I sent 14 of these games um, around the world to magazines and other people in the industry and then tried to sell the game because I didn't know how to. It should be pointed out at this time, Steve Faulkner was doing much the same sort of thing. He was making games on cassettes, giving mm. them to people with a notice in it saying, if you like the game, please send me money. <laughs> And giving the address, so it was a very early time. Um, the game basically failed, but SSI in America contacted me to say this: they were willing to do this game with another game they had, which was very small, in a in a game that I'd like to put out. And I immediately said yes, and immediately handed in my notice as a mass teacher, wow. which which said something about my mental <laughs> activity at the time. <laughs> Uh, so I then decided to go to uh, go to America, and I spent three months at SSI, basically learning how to actually make games. Um, Joel Billings at that time helped me make um, Operation Apocalypse, and literally, I was working on that game in the afternoon, about four o'clock, when the plane back to Sydney was leaving at nine. Um, and I was in Silicon Valley and I had to leave at the airport and I also had to go home and get all my stuff and pack it up and all the notes and take it with me. Um, I can, you know, that it was literally there the whole time. So I came back, Operation Apocalypse came out. It was, it was a, a very good game. And then I had arranged to do other games with SSI, but they weren't really making enough money to, for a living. So I then decided that I they'd offered me a job and I either had to take a job and move to America um, or something else. At that stage, I had just met Ian Trout and I wanted him to be a tester of mine. He took one look at the game and basically turned down the idea of being involved with me at much. Um, and I came back about a, a week or so later and he was much more enthusiastic. Hmm. During that week or two, he had been looking at American games and what had been coming out of other American companies and realized that what I'd shown him was actually a vast improvement on what he'd been looking at from other American companies. He hadn't realized the, I mean, the board game scene was so advanced at that stage, but the computer scene was just starting up. So he said, yes, he's now interested. And he would run the company side of things if I could do the programming because I really wasn't I wasn't up to running a company. So he started SSG. Um, we had to decide on a game. We decided on doing Stellar Conquest. So we took the game, uh, made the map board, uh, and started looking at how we would do it. The negotiations with Meta Gaming fell through, so we then changed every copyrightable element in the game, <laughs> redid, it, redid it from scratch uh, and put all the Reach for the Stars features and the things that Ian wanted and I wanted into the game. Uh, and that's how Reach for the Stars came about. Um, uh, I put it out, I, just one thing on Reach for the Stars, I thought that you couldn't guarantee winning um, a guy from Melbourne rang me up and said he could win every time, every single time without hesitation. And wow. I actually said that, that fateful comment, you can't. <laughs> he then said, yes, just do nothing for about a hundred turns. Wait, what? <laughs> yep. Put all, the, all your money goes into the bank. <laughs> and because the bank pays you a small amount of interest, by this time you get to the hundredth turn, you can make a super fleet every turn. But the computer, 
thinking you're only got a little little poultry planet which has only got a couple of industries on it, it ignores you. And then you just go around clobbering every computer planet in the game with a, this massive fleet you've made every turn. <laughs> I then immediately made a version of, I made my next version of the game where the computers all looked at your bank balance every turn. As soon as it got to a certain value, every computer player would turn on you. They would all know exactly where you are. And they would, they would all crunch you. <laughs> Hey, look That's at that rich uh, the empire story. over there. <laughs> That's right. That's amazing. Yeah, billionaires, who who cares? Let's just <laughs> crush them. It's a concept <laughs> which is coming back in fashion. Uh, Yay! Then, then, then we had to move on and end described this carriers at war game, which was completely alien to me. I, I, I had no idea. Um, I, I didn't like it when we started out. I. I thought it was a really strange way to go. Um, Ian was pretty insistent, as he can be, and Gregor knows this. Hmm. Um, and really, he had done a, he really had um, created a lot of opportunities for me. So I thought, right, uh, simple answer get behind this 100%, do it, see what happens. The best way to go. So I put every single bit of effort I could into this Carriers at War game, and it came out. And everyone said it was fantastic, <laughs> which which com- which completely surprised me. Even getting an award, which um, Ian and I were at a uh, in the hall, and they were giving out the Charles Roberts Awards, and we were just talking to each other because we knew we weren't going to win. And suddenly they called out our name, and and Ian looked at I at me, and I, I looked back at Ian, and what do we do now? <laughs> So I know one of us had to go up and get the award, and even to this day, I don't know which one of us it was. <laughs> it, you you don't, I mean, as an Australian, you don't beat Americans. Oh, uh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Look, it's, it surprised us. But Carries the War had a tremendous amount of attention, which um, I think surprised both of us. So we went into Europe ablaze. Um, which we felt was a good way to go. I learned a lot about the air war over Europe, which was a disaster in so many different ways. I, before that game, I thought being a pilot over Europe would have been one of the things I would have liked to do in World War II because you got good meals um, and you could land and relax. Uh, after doing that game, I figured that's not where I'd want to be. <laughs> There's a lot of negative points about that game. <laughs> Uh, oh. Pilots went through hell. Uh, mm. So, but the game did not do well. We, the game we moved on to was was the American Civil War game. Um, it was a grand game, grand scale. And halfway through development, we cut it because we were going to go broke. And that's when um, the Battlefront game came on the line. I wrote the Battlefront game in 14 weeks flat. Oh my God! <laughs> from the time from the time we actually said we were going to do it to the time it was actually on sale was fourteen weeks. Wow! Oh my um, God! I think I think I actually slept during that period, but I'm not a hundred percent sure. <laughs> Dear Lord! And, and it worked. Now at that point, Gregor comes like comes in line, and and takes it into a much more positive zone. <laughs> Over to you, Gregor. <laughs> I'd bought an Apple II in the late seventies, and um, went to the computer shop looking for games, as you did. And so, the first game I bought for my computer was a game called Southern Command that Roger had done with SSI about the nineteen seventy-three Arab Israeli War, and uh, yeah, I thought that was terrific. And then that shop just happened to be where. Ian and Roger came in to you know, look for games and chat and so on. So I knew them that way. Then I was a tester, and eventually I said, oh, I think you need to give me a job. And they did. <laughs> um, nice. So uh, I was there for the last bit of Europe Ablaze and then everything else that followed from that. Wow. And 
you know, what I remember of those days is that um, Battlefront, you know, Ian made a brave decision to not let you directly control oh. your units, right? Oh, really? Yeah. That, that was not the game I wanted, but again, it was the game I got. <laughs> really? You, you gave orders and the AI moved your units. Right. Ooh. Now, I didn't have to move them very far, um, but it meant that the game was easier to play. You didn't have to. And remember, this is on Apple II, right? So, right. you know, you've got a keyboard to control things, no mouse or anything, right? Just a keyboard. So it turns out that actually, yes, you can sit back and you can give these higher level decisions, and it's just really exciting and and as engaging as you like but it's not difficult to play and it doesn't take forever i have to i have to dig that up because that sounds like exactly the kind of strategy game i want i i am at a point where i don't want to move every little unit across the map just let me give them a general kind of order oh i gotta find that i gotta find and a so, that. okay um well, sorry you can find that or any of the ones that would use the same engine like Halls of Montezuma or Battles in Normandy or the Rommel or MacArthur's War or essentially the Civil War games. Um, but with the Civil War games, Ian and I had an had a interesting decision to make. He set up this whole command structure, of course, and he wanted it to reflect Civil War reality where, as a general, you had no guarantee that your commands would even be received. You had to give them to a bloke who galloped across the battlefield out to a core commander who then sent someone on to the division commander, etc. Um, or if they were received, no real guarantee that they'd be understood. And even if understood, no real guarantee that they'd be obeyed. Um, Ian really liked that idea. I said, oh, well, yes, but I want I don't want that. I want my decisions to be my decisions. I want to implement my iron will on the battlefield and make it so. So I had a big discussion about that and we ended up with the radio button. So if you want it pure, then you turn that off and, and you just have to deal with all the frustrations inherent in battlefield command at that time. If you don't, you turn it on. And all your ins orders go there instantly and are, and are obeyed huh. to the fullest. Um, Roger reckons about 10% people played with it off and 90% people played with it on, <laughs> which again goes back to my previous points about don't tell people how to play your game, right? right. Wherever possible, let them choose. You know? Don't enforce any purity of thought or action. It's their game. Let them do it. Um, and and that, that simple statement reflects about six months of discussion between Gregor and Ian at SSG over a number of years. <laughs> wow. Um, I'm going to have to dig these games up. I love playing old games like this. I'm going to have to find these. These sound great. But, but, no, sorry, Raj, go ahead. Oh, sorry. I was going to say... It, it really, when I look back on SSG, and a lot of the SSG <clears> staff <throat> are still friends of mine on Facebook, and I still talk to them on Facebook, mm -hmm. um, because we were essentially a, a, a one, if you don't mind me using this, we're one happy family. I mean, it, a lot of people just enjoyed being part of SSG. Um, I can always remember our, our, um, our head, second head artist, Alistair, walking in uh, on the first day. He's still a, a friend of mine on Facebook, as I said, and um, he just said, "Oh, what am I? Do what am I doing here?" And, and Angie said, "Oh, you're the head artist. He said, well, what do I do?" And he says, "Don't worry, I will explain it to you later." <laughs> <laughs> but he, he he really had no idea, but he was such a talented individual. And his work was just amazing. The only thing you knew from about Alistair was never actually ask for a violent picture because he would then give you one. <laughs> <laughs> we we couldn't actually use it. 
Oh no! <laughs> in, in any of our publications, um, but his artwork is brilliant. Uh, as was Nick, um, uh, was the other head artist, and his artwork, even to this day, is absolutely brilliant. So, do you guys still work in gaming? Are you guys like actively making any game at all? Either of you? I've we're never. In, we're inactively making games. <laughs> <laughs> I've I've never given up programming, um, and I'm torn at the moment between a, a, a I'm I'm working on one project. Um, I would really like to um, come up with a, an Unreal project as well, because I I do oh. like Unreal over Unity, um, and really, when you look at the the modern Unity dash Unreal engines, they, they are tremendous. Uh, right. You do get arguments as to which is better. Uh, I don't care. Um, <laughs> uh, and I do not like Unreal because I'm a C++ person. Um, as I explained, one uh, Unity game I did, I wrote most of the co- code in C++ as a DLL. Uh, <laughs> because that, Well, that way the bloody Unity memory manager doesn't get hold of it and you, you can do things fast. <laughs> and, um, so the two engines are very good, but I prefer uh, Unreal for the blueprints. Okay. So are you guys, um, you said back in the day you didn't have time to play anything. Do you have time to play stuff now? And if so, what are you playing? At the moment, I, I play a lot of Gems of War. I've, there's several <laughs> other things that I have been playing. Oh, yeah, I <clears throat> play that every day. but. Really, I more play around with programming as opposed to play games. I, huh. um, yeah, I, this is one of the idiotic things you get as being a programmer. Uh, I'm not too sure, Gregor. Uh, I play a lot of World of Warships. Uh, oh, World of Warships. I've not played that one. Uh, the ships are beautiful. <laughs> right. One of, one of the regrets, I think, is that you know, for Carrier's War, for instance, when that was popular and when those, that style of games was popular, we there was never really the money, it was never that popular, so there was never really the money to do a proper 3D version of that game. And so the stuff in World of Warships is, you know, the, the level of graphical detail and brilliance that, that you know in a different universe you would put into a carriers of war game um, but you can't uh, just not enough people will play it and and world of warships is makes no real pretense at, at any sort of simulation whatsoever right I mean it's got all sorts of shortcuts and stuff for game purposes but that is what you need to do to get the audience in order to be able to afford a sumptuous 3D game played for free, right? So I have no qualms whatsoever about what they do in order to to make that game successful. But it looks looks wonderful, and the ships look gorgeous. Um, and uh, I still play the next Borderlands and the next Fallout and, and related type games, uh, Far Cry, things like that. I, 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 I have a hankering for recreational slaughter on a personal scale from time to time. <laughs> oh, I'm with um, you there. I wouldn't knock the graphics in the Carriers of War games, though, because, like, a certain type of, gra- like, 2D graphics really holds up even today, whereas, like, certain old 3D graphics, not so much, you know? So, <clears throat> so I, I, if- sorry, go ahead. Sorry, if you if you want to to get to the heart of carriers at war, try and get hold of the carriers at war construction kit, which details all of the AI and how it works. And you know, if you wade through the two hundred and eighty page manual or whatever it is on ooh, that game ooh, monster, ooh, ooh. I gotta but, get, you know, I gotta, uh, I gotta track down a copy just for that manual. Oh man, that yeah, sounds amazing. That, that lays out the system that Ian 
basically design called war cards, which uses essentially a hypercardy type concept to program the AI, which means that anybody can program the AI. Now, only a handful of people in the world have done it, not many outside of, of our company, but it's all there. And um, you'll see, you know, the, the way that Ian was able to distill the essence of what you have to go back a bit. You always have to match what you want the AI to do with what the AI can actually do. Now, it can't do very much, right? It doesn't think. It just adds up, right? So that system there is, is I think, the, the one that, that Ian designed and that Roger programmed is, is uh, the best for war game AI. It's helped by the fact that the nature of carrier battles, you know, you have a wide open battlefield and you don't have that many units helps. But even there, you know, the carrier, you can program the carrier to carry out its searches and you tell it, okay, what to do if this happens. Uh, and there's always this little random element, as I said. And to me, the carrier's AI opponent is the best we ever did. Oh, wow. And just to reinforce in there too, um, during this process, we actually programmed the Nimitz coming in um, to Hawaii uh, on uh, 1941, 7th of December, to see what would happen and to violate the conditions of a certain film. <laughs> uh, and the Japanese really didn't like that. Uh, but, the Nimitz, <laughs> but the Nimitz actually lost one plane. <laughs> in that simulation that I, that I watched. Uh, and that was part of the random algorithm that said you could, you know, things could go wrong. Uh, it wasn't that the fact they shot it down. Um, F-16s were really not going to be touched by the Japanese. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry, f um, As This is one of the big problems I have is that I am not, militarily A grade, whereas Gregor and Ian were, 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 were A plus. Uh, and, all about the uh, toys. So I, it's all about the toys. Oh, like, <laughs> it's funny. I looked up the, uh, the carriers of war construction kit on eBay to see if some, if there was a copy available with the manual, cause I need that manual. Uh, there's only one copy. And it's only the discs. God darn we it. Can, we can find a manual to send it to you. It's no problem. Oh, I, okay. Oh, that, yeah. If if okay, if you have one to spare, I will take it. <laughs> I will pay for shipping. From I will pay for the shipping, because um, that won't be cheap. <laughs> but but uh, I would love to read that manual. I I miss I, uh, I miss a good manual so much. You know these days. So if it was actually smaller, I could put it online, uh, you know, just um, uh, scan it and put it online. All our, all our magazines, the 24 of them, have been put online and are available for download. Oh, right. Um, you guys had a magazine for a while. Uh, the Run 5 magazine, um, which Gregor can describe why we had it and why it's there. Well, all of our games uh, post-reach had... Uh, a construction kit in them, right? A full editor. And essentially, you got everything that we use to make the game. There's, there's nothing held back, right? So theoretically, on purchase of one of those games, you could you can make an entirely new game. Uh, and some people did. Um, you know, uh, but we always gave that to people. And the magazine existed so that we could have extra scenarios. There's no downloading yeah, no DLC or anything. So uh, we created the magazine and it would have the data in the magazine plus articles about things we thought were interesting. Uh, and then you could also get the magazine by subscription with the discs. They didn't have to type in all the stuff. And that was pretty successful. It was a lot of work back then. Um, and Ian was so, so happy when desktop publishing was a thing. And we bought one of the first leases in Australia, pre-Macintosh, purely to do the desktop publishing for, for Run 5. Cost about $15,000. Oh, my God. Not, <laughs> not, not counting the $5,000 for the five 
megabyte hard drive. Um, <laughs> Five megabytes. But it, it, it was it was revolutionary. It, yeah. It changed the world, right? Um, so yeah. uh, you know that went on for for a long time with just scenarios and articles and, and things of interest for for people playing our game. That, that's kind of amazing. I I I miss those days when magazines were a thing. Uh, especially printed magazines. I mean, I know everything's online now, but there was a thrill about like, ooh, the new PC gamer is out or whatever. You know, there was a thrill about that that is long gone. We had we had a lot of people writing letters to us, and uh, the one thing I really enjoyed once we sat around uh, and we talked about games we would like to do, and they were put into the Run Five magazine. And one of them was, I think it was Warlords 14, <laughs> where, where <laughs> basically, basically you send us your address and pay us lots of money, and we will send around a whole group of guys dressed in medieval gear to beat you up. <laughs> <laughs> um, that is great. Oh, my God. That is amazing. Uh, I, I remember really enjoying those meetings. Oh my god, that is great. We're gonna wrap so up. Battle, uh, you cry. <laughs> uh, uh well, we do have one question from the chat uh regarding SSI since that came up earlier. Uh and I'll just read it verbatim here. What was the corporate culture back then uh like? We as kids <laughs> always imagined that there was a bunch of quote unquote old guys with a lot of books programming those games. At SSI, when I was there, uh, the old guys then, uh, I was the oldest of the old guys because I was uh, 30. Um, they were all younger than me. Oh, wow. So, so basically, it was between, everyone was about, between about 20 and 30. John Lyon, I, I don't know his age, um, but he, he may have been older than me. He did Bismarck, which was the very first game. Oh, yeah. But he then disappeared from the scene after um after that um i have to ask joel as to where he went i've been friends with joel since that time so um that's many many years and i'm a lot older than 30 now <laughs> um the, the they were in a uh, when i was there which was the very point when they started they were in a very small building um i basically during the three months i was there uh, worked from 10 in the morning, um, 11 sometimes, till about 10 at night. So I, I was given a key to let myself out and lock up. Um, and uh, I like working at night because there was no one around. All I could do was work. I couldn't talk. They had a coffee machine and a popcorn machine all the time online. Uh, all the chairs were on, on little rollers. You could kick yourself across the room, get your coffee and your popcorn kick again and just glide across to your computer again <laughs> and get back to work. Uh, I thought this was heaven. <laughs> and, um, it really was a very good experience, but I also learned from Joel how he ran the company, the problems he was having running the company. I met a person there, for example, called Trip Hawkins, who was one of the directors of SSI. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It was, you know Trip Hawkins. I oh I, I think I'm friends with him on Facebook. <laughs> now he he actually decided after giving up uh, directorship of SSI he'd go along up to San Mateo and set up his own company, which he then did. Mm. Uh, and Electronic Arts came into existence. Um, but it also showed me that talking to people and and this is why I, I came to America very often after that point, talk to people, get to know them. Um, uh, associate particularly in terms of ai so at ssi for example um uh, i met in those days dan bunton who became uh, danny bunton very later on um his ai ideas were brilliant um later uh with with mark baldwin and uh will wright um the talking to these individuals just just settled my ideas about how you approach the logic of going about writing AI in games. This was not available in any book, and I believe still isn't. <laughs> um, but what they do now uh, is you have 
AI rut routines like ASTAR, for example, which any programmer knows about. In those days, there was not an ASTAR, and not only that, but there was no space in the machine to have ASTAR operating. So if you wanted to do a movement routine, it had to be yours and it had to be small. Um, that actually applied to every single thing in the machine. Uh, so essentially talking to people really gave you a good idea of where to go and how to lay out things in the, in the machine. Um, and you would, by talking, uh, really express yourself. And um, it was a, a wonderful time in my life to meet all these individuals. Uh, very talented. Uh, yeah, talking of electronic arts, we, we yeah. had dealings with them in the very early days. Oh. They were selling things like Carriers at War for us as an affiliated label. Oh. Back back in the day when they were electronic artists, as they started out, and, and they had a supply of, of Nerf guns in their boardroom in case hilarity would break out, which is hard to imagine these days. Um, but I think one of the stories of SSG is that where we're able to do things on our own, we were very happy and we were quite successful. Where we had to work with other companies, either the industry would change or they would change or both, hmm. and, and then we're back working on our own. So, you know, electronic arts got too big to be bothered with us. Mm. Broderbun was fantastic, but when the, the brothers sold out, that started them on a line that led to Ubisoft. Oh. Right. So, you know, it's, and that's these days, it's possible, it's more possible to be an independent and remain independent because of the existence of things like Steam. Right. Uh, assuming you can get past all the problems of discovery and all that sort oh of stuff. Oh, my God. But, oh, yeah. You know, it, it is possible, and the programming tools and the support tools are there to mean that small teams are viable again, right? And, and Australian development proves this, right? We don't mm. have any big companies anymore. They're all small or smallish or very small companies uh, still making great games because the current ecosystem allows that. But that hasn't always been the case. Um, so, you know, you, you have to adapt to the way things are changing in your industry and, and not all change is good. You guys seem to adapt pretty well because, you know, SSG, you know, I mean, it still exists, but it, it was prolific for quite a long time. Yeah, and uh, there was some, some months there when no one knew if they were going to get paid or not. And oh, damn. Roger and I have spent long periods where we didn't get paid at all right so you know oh. it, it's it's never been entirely smooth sailing for more than a couple of years at a time um, but as you say we're still here and we certainly didn't want to do anything else so we're not whinging <laughs> yeah but when you got paid for those periods where you weren't paid they were great <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was always made up <laughs> well, that's good. Speaking of forgotten things, did you guys ever come across the Warlords card game? Wait, what? <laughs> wait, wait, wait a minute. Warlords card game. There was a card game? That's a brilliant uh, card game. We, again, because, you know, we, we're not a card game <laughs> company, so we had right. to work with another company. We ended up with uh, Iron Crown Enterprises, who then went bust, right? So the games, the game was published. There, there's stuff around. Um, don't know if Roger's still got lots of it left. I think I've got some somewhere. I've got um, several thousand cards if you want them, Gregor. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, no, it was, again, you know, that we tried that, but, you know, the, the people that we had to work with ultimately proved to be not viable. And so that, Oh yeah, I see. Nineteen ninety-seven. Then wasn't. <laughs> yeah, I see. Nineteen ninety-seven. It came out ish. ish. And, and uh, it was based on Warlords Three. Oh wow! And apparently they didn't last. Sadly, two-day players. I wonder if I wonder if copy still exists somewhere. <laughs> 
Besides what you guys have. Well, actually, yeah, I was going to say it does exist, but yeah. <laughs> wow. I, I, but even, even uh, for example, um, I know we published one game because we bought it in. We had an individual that did that game and we did all the artwork we, and we published it. I can't find that on the internet. Oh. Um, so either my so either my brain has completely gone berserk, which I don't <laughs> think it has yet. Um, I just do not understand where that game has just disappeared. There is just no notification of it at all. Uh, game preservation is, it, a t- is a topic I could do a whole podcast about. Yeah. But but it did fail spectacularly. Um, oh, it was it was a, a game that we this guy had had. He was really in, you know really incentivized to get it out there and we took it and we published it um and it wasn't a bad game but it, it just wasn't up to the things on the market and just failed was it the was it the fire king game the rpg no there? Oh, okay. thing was done with uh, micro 40 and it actually did okay i mean if it had been a year before that it would have worked very well um but it really didn't sell a great number. It didn't, uh, it, it really didn't matter. Like, SSG was doing enough games at that stage where it didn't really matter. Um, the games that we were selling, that were selling well, uh, were giving us enough money to get by. Right. Oh, yeah, I was just curious. Simon Hayes, who did our first graphics system, was part of Microforte, mm. and that eventually morphed into Big World, which made all the technology that underlies World of Warships and World of Tanks. Really? Um, yes. 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 Wow. The yeah, the threads going through all this are amazing. <laughs> and uh, their their company is still in Sydney, um, oh, and. Good. They, they had, and I remember speaking to them at the end of the nineties, um, cause I've, I've, I've had, always had a close association with the micro 40 mob, um, which then developed and had different names. Um, and so has Gregor, but their, their whole idea was to make a network game of a type, which the world has never seen. And after a while, they found that running out of money was a reason to modify your um, modify your uh, ideas about where you want to go. So they got to a point where they said, well, let's just sell the engine because we've finished that. And then we'll do the game after that, once we've got a bit of money in. So they actually sold the network engine to the Koreans, uh, to a number of Korean companies. But well, then the Korean it. companies wanted... Yeah, license it, and that, but they had they needed to support that and changed various features, and so they started working on the engine ex- pretty intensively, and couldn't finish the game because of all the work they were doing. But they were getting money; those was, was no problem. And then it got to a point where uh, the um, World of Warcraft guys, uh, World of War whatever gaming. it is, tanks, War and, yeah, yeah, War Gaming came along and just said, you know, we'd like to buy you, know, basically take you over. Um, and you will become a networking engine uh, worldwide. And they they accepted that deal. Um, but I still believe at his heart, Simon still wants to make his game. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I'm sorry. I don't know if you guys heard that noise. I looked up World of Warships on Steam because I'm going to install it now that you guys have talked it up so much. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a good game. I believe it. Uh, it well, my cat is telling me it is time to feed her, which means we need to wrap up. <laughs> She's very <laughs> insistent that uh, she get fed. Gentlemen, it has been just a delight talking to you guys uh, and hearing your stories about, you know, your history with video gaming, SSG's history, all that stuff. It has just been a thrill talking to you guys. I feel like I've learned so much about Australia, especially uh, this <laughs> evening. <laughs> That I didn't know before, for good, for better or for worse. Um, but you, you can't come here. Just a point. Oh well, I, I. Oh, sorry. Unless you're, unless you're a tennis player. Oh, uh, 
Yeah, no, I I wouldn't go anywhere right now, honestly. <laughs> I'm, I'm not going. I'm not going anywhere. Uh, I'm staying indoors until this is all over, just like House of the Shaun of the Dead. Um, so Henry VIII, are you? <laughs> I'm just going to hide. I'm just going to be a hermit playing and streaming my games. Uh, folks, thank you so much uh, for listening and uh, watching uh, and, and being involved. It was a good chat tonight. A lot of people talking in the chat. A lot of fond memories of your games, you guys, uh, in the chat tonight. Uh, next week, we're going to be welcoming on the developer of Power of Ten. It is a space roguelike where uh, your overall goal is to save people, which is a novel concept. Uh, <laughs> usually it's the opposite. Um, and Thursday on our land party, we're going to, what's it called? What, Spaz, what's it called? Rogue Heroes? I can never, it's, it's such a generic it's, name. Uh, Rogue Heroes, Ruins of Tassos. Okay. It, I can never remember the name because it's so, Rogue Heroes. It's so generic. I might as well put Void in there as well. Rogue Void Heroes. it will be more generic. Um, but that's going to do it for this week's folk. Gentlemen, again, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to talk to us. It again has been just a delight to uh, hear your stories. And uh, again, thank you, Trevor, for helping put all this together. Uh, with that, folks, we'll bid you a good night or a good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Uh, take